I mean, commercially speaking, this just makes the most sense. You know, I've really, really, really got to get better at remembering to tell you all to subscribe earlier in the video. This is like the fourth or fifth straight one where I've had to cut in and say, hey, please subscribe. So, please subscribe. Hello, Emmett Ryan here from Ball in Europe. And we're here today to talk about women's basketball, which has automatically meant that quite a few of you decided not to click on this video, which uh, I can't say what I want to say because YouTube tends to demonetize swearing if it's early in a video. Not that we're monetized, but we're hoping to get there. I'll talk more about that part later. But essentially, Europe's got a problem in that it's missing a very, very obvious opportunity here, and that's around, like, you know, half the people that play basketball, female players. So let's look at what's happened with the WNBA, which has not exactly been the fastest in realizing its opportunities. I think it took it over a decade to realize, on the commercial side, just to be clear, I don't mean everywhere else, on the commercial side alone, that it had great penetration with the LGBTQ plus community and was getting a lot of its fans from there. Despite, you know, being a sport where you had a lot of people who are LGBTQ, but also openly so, and were able to be their true selves, the WNBA for a long time didn't realize that. That's the basic level of not getting it. But look at how it's come along. Now, we heard, of course, a couple of weeks ago, ION is gonna mean there's gonna be guaranteed time slots every week for the WNBA. People will know appointment viewing to tune in. And they've built stars, they've built personalities. So has NCAA college basketball. I mean, frankly, you know, more people I know were talking about the women's game in college hoops than the men's game this year, you know, and that's not an accident because the college game has built stars and so is the, so and so it has. And it's a lot of that is because those stars stay in longer. And we're gonna to get to that with the women's yearly part in a second, because the big names hang about in college women's hoops and they develop that identity with the school they're in. And then they go on to WNBA and they can still build off that. The biggest names in the women's hoops also play in EuroLeague. Like, look at the Fenerbahce team that won a couple of weeks ago the EuroLeague title. Yes, that was on by the couple of weeks ago. And a lot of you tuning in may not even have realized it. Now, for those of you who do, listen, trust me, this isn't preaching to convert us early, but stuff for those of you who are big fans of women's basketball, there will be that for you later. Don't worry. This is more for the people who aren't aware. Like Brianna Stewart, Courtney Vandersloot, Emma Messiman, Alina Yagapova. I mean, this is a loaded roster. You know, and these are people who have big names, great personal stories, but are also just really cool to watch at basketball and have huge brands in their own right that that can be built off. Yet somehow an awful lot of people didn't know that Women's EuroLeague was going on. The finals, that is, I'm sure most people tuning in couldn't tell me when Women's EuroLeague games were on during the season that went by or even how many games were played. And I think that's kind of the problem. They're like missing an obvious thing here is that this is a product FIBA wholly controls with some of the biggest names in the sport. Like, and frankly, there is more cachet in the name brands of the players playing Women's EuroLeague than there is, and I'm not being harsh here, in pretty much any other player currently on the continent today in the men's game. Like, as in European players who ply their trade in Europe because the best European men only play in the NBA. Obviously a few really good ones, just to be clear. And by really good ones I mean extraordinary superb ballers who I love to watch play in EuroLeague. But the ones with the biggest name recognitions, you know, they're, they're in the NBA. And the best European women with name recognition play in the WNBA, but the best of the Americans and the Europeans play in women's EuroLeague too. And I mean, it's like, you've got these huge individual brands and you've not somehow made this into a hip product where, hey, this is really cool with some serious ballers. And I'm just stunned by it. Like, it's like you've got an old, by the way, women's Eurobasket is coming up. You may not be aware of that. At least the timing of it is smart, even though it's sort of not mandatory smart that it's June, so it's before the WNBA season starts. Not exactly confident it's going to be cleverly cross-promoted to tie in a sort of, you know, here's this and the NBA. I'm sure the host broadcasters will try and do something, but I just look at this and kind of go, women's Euro League final was played in an arena that can't even house 2,000 people. What has happened to the sport here? And that's the thing. We have some serious hard workers at the sport across the continent. When Ireland's women returned to the European qualifiers for the first time, that would have been in the autumn of 2021, I was super excited. First time since we had to basically 
stop I think it was 08 or 09 was the last women's competitive international that wasn't a small countries tournament so it's like you're talking like a 13 14 year gap it was huge I flew to the Netherlands man uh, you know it was uh, during some restrictions in COVID indeed the Netherlands dropped some extra restrictions literally the day I was flying out and uh, but I was like I'm not missing this uh, I didn't miss the home game that Sunday although I was covering it for TV Made sure I got at least one of their summer friendlies in. I actually amusingly, I say amusingly, I mean very irritatingly, managed to miss their two other home games and qualifiers because guess who got sick twice in the last year and that the illness, second of which was hilariously contagious, but not COVID oddly, around the time of Irish home and internationals. I basically checked the calendar now to wonder if I'm going to be ill. But anyway, that game in the Netherlands, because I've digressed a bit here, it was in an arena the right size. Now, granted, there was restrictions, but that kind of worked. So you had a full house, about 2,000 people, and it looked like a full house. Like, it looked good on screen. It looked like this is a big deal. And that's the thing with any sports product. You have got to sell it as it being a big deal. You want people to buy in? Make it a big deal. It doesn't just become a big deal from thin air. You bring what you have as assets together, you make it look as big as it can. More people are interested in an asset. That means you can get a bit bigger and on and on and on. And it's that they haven't copped this with in EuroLeague and that you have this absolute overflowing, overwhelming number of wonderful assets and you can't do it. And I look at women's Eurobasket and I know already that outside of games featuring the hosts, it's not going to be great for crowds. Like, although to be fair, men's Eurobasket isn't typically great for that either. But it's a little bit more dependent actually Men's Zero Basket is often terrible for that, although it has improved a lot in recent years. That's mainly because of the multi-host format. That said, you can be smart again about that, how you shape the product and what's the stories you're telling, because you want to build up a minority sport. Well, you've seen every other sport that's tried to gain traction outside of the monster that is football, really, in Europe, and the NFL in America, and college football, obviously, is a secondary one, is human stories. That's what sells it. Like, you look at the success of the WNBA, you look at the success of women's NCAA, it's being able to sell a story of the individual within the team. And that's something you've got to build around. But you've also got to work around the resources you have and realize how to best utilize them. And I don't mean the players in that, I mean your volunteers, I mean your actual employees. Like, I look at, you know, Ireland, and there's great work being done by lots of people. And I still see areas where efficiency is kind of improved, which will actually make their lives easier as well, by the way. Uh, so they might even be doing less than they are now, which is great because they get to have a bigger impact for less work. I think a lot of people would like that. Uh, the classic one being, I think, you know, you look at a league like Ireland, the UK has already started doing it to some degree with BBL. Like, have more formal crossover between, like, you know, men's and women's clubs in the same locality, even if they aren't the same club. Like, you get a Colester in Ireland, for example, that's great because they're all one club brilliant. You may not be able to have a one-club model, but you can have a, come on, let's be smart model. And, you know, we already have informal arrangements of that across Ireland. Let's formalize these and try and work out so that, like, you know, if, you know, like, I mean, in Europe as well, use it to sell, because Europe has the multi-sport model. Like, it's not really a thing in the UK and Ireland, but, like, you look at a Barcelona, the amount of teams it has. You look at a Lazio in Italy, which isn't really a basketball club, but, you know, it's a good example. Benfica, obviously. And you think about, you know, you've got this, you know, community around your club be smart about how you build the women's side around it and you know what you're going to do you're going to grow that community and you're going to get more people involved more people spending money more people helping and there's kind of a commercial thing to bring up here as well what we've largely seen for all the talk of oh let's assume all the sexist arguments out of the way but the big thing is sure if they were as popular as the men they, then they get paid like the men whatever about that they can actually see the men getting paid more. And that's the part you weren't expecting me to say. Like, we've already seen in other sports, like, you know, it's helped in rugby, although rugby is doing all it can to hurt itself in that respect, but it's definitely helped in football, is that putting interest into the women's game has actually helped a lot of clubs, particularly at grassroots level, in terms of having more regular supporters for their men's teams. Because a lot of, you know, the classic one is, the dad brings his daughter to watch the women's team play, and enjoys the day out himself, and, go, and the two of them go along to the men's team as well, because you get more daddy-daughter time. That's your most general anecdotal one. But here's the other part. Sponsors are hungry, hungry, hungry for women's sports and women's sports stories right now. You can see it across the continent. And when you bring in a women's team into, into an organization, you immediately attract new sponsors, because it also creates, of course, 
more room for you to build out your sponsor base as any sports organization. Now, Fenerbahce has multiple sponsors, for example, and the, and the women's are amongst those. But how you explode that, or exploit that, to maximize revenue is an area. Like Fenerbahce, I have lots of money. And for them, the goal is winning EuroLeague. Great. For that, for me, what I want is the goal to be winning EuroLeague and have everybody in the Fenerbahce organization, from, I mean, every fan, every stakeholder, going wild over it. That's what I really want. And I want everybody, more importantly, of their rivals, being really annoyed about it, that they're also happy. That's the story I want to see. Uh, you know, that it really, really hurts the Gala fans. It really, really hurts the Besiktas fans. And just to be clear, I've got nothing against those two clubs and I've got nothing particularly for Fenner. I just love the, you know, the, the, the passion that, you know, these have for your men's teams. Let's see it back in the women's teams and, and vice versa. Because again, it can actually bring in more money and money's good, but I've got a plan. So I mentioned we get some of the best players in the world, like the best players in the world, come to Europe for Women's EuroLeague. And I've looked at how storytelling has helped some sports grow. And the classic example recently has been F1 Drive to Survive. What it's done for Formula One in the US market is simply extraordinary. No getting around that at all. There have been way too many other shows. Like there's the Breakpoint one in tennis. There's the golf one. These are just Netflix ones going on. There's a rugby one. And there's obviously been always been the last chance to use as well, of course, which are very different because they're at the last chance level, so to speak, at the development level of the sport. And there's Welcome to Wrexham, uh, which is more like the elite ones, even though it's an elite one. So I'm until I die. I mean, I can go on, I can go on, I can go on. There's a lot of these. So there is an overkill of them. But the reason Drive to Survive stands out is because it's a really well-made show that tells compelling stories. The reasons the other ones don't stand out and the reason I have no interest in watching the rugby one and I'm a big rugby fan is you can tell even before it starts that maybe it won't be that compelling. The golf one apparently has got some good stuff but I just haven't bothered watching it. I'm not a big golf fan. Golf is a thing I just sit back and chill with. Uh, nothing, no offense if you're a golfer. But like Breakpoints has been annoyed, annoyed a lot of tennis fans because frankly it feels like it's even less of the personalities. You've got some pretty blunt and clear but interesting personalities playing the top tier of basketball across Europe. Europe, FIBA, I'm giving you a freebie here. But it's gonna be a condition, and it doesn't involve me getting money, which is a bad thing. I'm telling you how to tell the stories. Grind to survive. So nice and simple, and you're basically steal the drive to survive one. The big condition is, FIBA, you're not producing it. You've got to go with someone who's better than you at in-house production. And that's not a beef on your in-house production. I'm saying you've got to try and sell the story to whoever the biggest, baddest mf -er out there who will do it for you is. Ideally Netflix, but ideally somebody with a huge platform. And your goal is to tell the basketball stories of the stars and the people you don't necessarily know about of women's Euro. You've got plenty of Anglophones across Europe, so it's very easy to do that way. You've got a mix of talents. You got to see, like, Emma Messerman is best known for a time in the WNBA. Let's get the stories of her in Europe. You know, obviously, Bree Stewart is just a walking story in herself, like her MVP performance in the championship game. That can almost be your starting off point for episode one. But you have so many different ways to do this. And that's going to get people talking, especially if it's good. And especially another big reason people, you know, produce it is it's somebody independent producing. That means they're going to be more authentic. And, is, and the people producing aren't going to be worried about annoying well, you, to be honest, in case things get a little bit close to the bone. And you want things to get close to the bone. That's better for your bottom line. So, yeah, grind to survive. That's how we make money. And that's how we get more people caring about women's basketball. It, it's not a catch-all. We know that. There are no catch-alls. There's no single silver bullet. But the point is, stories are how we get people caring. Stories are, frankly, interesting. And, you know, people like stories. Humans are about stories. And if you want to see more stories, I've got plenty of them to tell right here on this YouTube channel. I know, seamless. So subscribe, please, and you'll hear more of my stories. And uh, ring that bell and tell me what else, what other stories you want me to tell. Until next time.